Good morning and happy Wednesday. Hope you're all having a great midweek so far. We're almost there. The end of the day will be more than halfway for the work week. But today I'm just going to re review two small sets from the mid-90s. One is from 1996. It's the Max Odyssey Top 5 of 2005. I believe it's 96 Max Odyssey. Looks like Max Odyssey. But uh, we'll review that one real quick. And the 1994 Brickyard High Tech Top 10 Finisher Set. So let's go ahead and open up the Top 5 of 2005. Actually, it's 1995 Max. I should know better than that. The backs just look like Odyssey cards. But it, it chronicled five drivers that they felt in 2005, which was 10 years from 2005, obviously that would be um, contenders for NASCAR championships or future stars at this point. So let's review them and see see what happened. The first card is set here, Bobby Labonte. There you see him when he won his only Bush Grand National Championship in 1991. Of course, Bobby would win the Cup Series Championship in 2000. So they hit the nail on the head with this one. So uh, they did good with this, this pick. The second one, Ricky Craven. Ricky won a couple of Bush Series races. He was the 1991 Bush North Series champion. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ricky did go on to win two Bush standalone races and two Cup Series races and I believe one or two Truck Series races later in his career. He never won a championship. He did finish second in 1993 to Steve Grissom in the Bush Series standings and I believe he was third in 1994 behind David Green and I want to say Chad Little, but I know I'm wrong. Um, but he was he had a couple good top five finishes in the Bush Series. Then he had a couple wrecks in the Cup Series that derailed his career. Go on the Scene Vault podcast because they've got parts one and two, and I haven't downloaded part three yet because it hasn't uh, dropped yet. But they have a, a two part interview so far, and it's going to be three parts with Ricky Craven that has just been outstanding. And he talks about his injuries and and the things that he went through to get to where he was in Cup. So go give them a listen, Scene Vault podcast. I like to throw everybody a little love because uh, those guys have. Uh, mentioned me a couple of times on their podcast, so I really appreciate it. But the interview with Ricky Craven was is really in-depth, and I highly recommend it. Card number three of this five-card set is Shane Hall. Shane was from a driver from South Carolina, raced a lot with Jason Keller, and Jason just mentioned him on the Zoomcast, the Scene Vault Zoomcast this past week, how they kind of came up together and raced a little bit. Uh, Shane was an up-and-coming driver. He just never got the good opportunities. He did he did some good things in some smaller cars on the Bush Series, but just never had this chance to move up. I believe he probably still races maybe late models or something in the Carolinas. Not real sure. He kind of fell off the map in the late 90s. Um, but he, he was uh, 94, 95. He was looking really hot and moving up to move up and just never got the right opportunity. Card number four of this five-card set is Toby Porter. Toby, I believe, ran in the NASCAR either Northwest or Southwest division and did move up to the truck series and, and, and had mediocre success. I can't remember the truck team that he ran for, but again, it was just he, he just was kind of like Shane Hall, right place, wrong time, or wrong place, right time, however you want to say it. Um, had a lot of talent, but just couldn't get the equipment to match his talent. And sometimes some guys are just short track kings, and that does not translate to big tracks. I think drivers you can look back, Butch Lindley, Sam R., Jack Ingram, those kind of guys, they were short track dominant, but once they went to the speedway, it just wasn't their thing. Maybe Butch Miller, uh, Dick Trickle, Bob Sinegar, those guys ran awesome on short tracks. They just couldn't translate it to the super speedways. And then our fifth and final card in the set, yeah, I want to make sure there, uh, David Hutto. David was a Goodies Dash Series champion. Go back and look up some Goodies Dash races. This was a subcompact series that for a long time ran four and later six-cylinder cars. And they would run tracks as short as a quarter mile and as tracks as big as Daytona because they would open their season at Daytona during speed weeks. Uh, at the end of 2003, NASCAR and Goodies both terminated their agreement with the series. The series did move on. There's a couple nice videos that document this. But David, he was just kind of caught up in that shuffle. He was a, a Dash Series champion, tried to make the move to Bush Series. Again, it just did not translate. I don't know if it was equipment. I don't know if it was driver or combination of both. 
and not all drivers are going to be great super speedway drivers. A lot of people, uh, like Jeff Gordon, Tony Stewart, that came from short tracks and dirt tracks, it translated perfectly into to NASCAR. Other drivers, like Jason Leffler and J.J. Gailey, who were just as successful as those guys on the dirt tracks and the short tracks, that, that talent just did not translate over. So what whatever caused that, I don't I don't know. I can't answer that. But this next set is from the 1995 uh, high tech set or 94, depending on who you want to talk about, because usually a year after is when they do these sets. But this reviews the top 10 finishers of the inaugural Brickyard 400. You can see it kind of has, and there was all sorts of different backgrounds. I believe I got several of them represented here. But the, they had stars, they had raindrops, they had all, all sorts of holographic backgrounds. I believe there was even one that had the uh, scoring pylon in the pit lane in the background as well. But obviously this is the winner, Jeff Gordon. At the time he won a record, and I apologize, you may have heard my wife sneeze in the background. But at any rate, Jeff won the first um, Brickyard 400, and at the time a record $613,000 purse for winning that race. And that was his second career win. Runner-up was Brett Bodine, who was in his last year driving for Kenny Bernstein in the Quaker State Fords. I believe that was his best finish in 1994. His only career win, of course, came in 1990 at North Wilkesboro. Third place, they did not have the licensing rights to use Bill Elliott's name, so it's just Budweiser car. As a matter of fact, you can even see they... Uh, airbrushed his name off, and, and on the uh, quarter panels of Bill's car, they airbrushed out a sponsor. They actually had Bill Elliott barbecue sauce on the quarter panels of the car, so there is no mention of Bill Elliott whatsoever in this set. Matter of fact, if you even flip it over, it just says Budweiser Ford, blah, 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 and third place finish. So they had the rights to use the car, just not Bill's name. He was one of the first ones to trademark his name, and they had to pay him for usage. Fourth place finisher in 94 was Rusty Wallace, who had a solid run that day. Fifth place finisher, Dale Earnhardt, who started from the outside of the front row and tried so hard to lead the first lap, ended up scrubbing the wall and spent the rest of the day playing catch-up. I think he could have maybe moved up to fourth. If you watch the end of the race with about four laps to go, Ernie Irvin's battling Jeff Gordon for the lead and cuts a tire. He pits, he comes out. The leaders pass him, and Ernie blends into traffic in fifth car in line pushing Earnhardt back to the sixth car in line, and he kept blocking Earnhardt and wouldn't let him pass because the other three cards in front of Dale were Fords, and Ernie was in a Ford. So if you go back and watch the end of that race, it's pretty obvious what happened. Sixth place finisher, Darrell Waltrip, one of his best runs in 94. Seventh place, Kenny Schrader. I believe Kenny finished fourth in points in 94. He had a really, really strong year, just no win. So a seventh place finish in the Brickyard, really nice. 8th place finisher, Michael Waltrip, driving for Chuck Ryder in the Bahari Pennzoil Pontiac team. That would be a solid run for this team. Ninth place, Todd Bodine. So two Bodines and two Waltrips in the top ten. That doesn't happen a lot at Indianapolis. But Todd Bodine, driving Butch Mox uh, Factory Stores of America Ford, had a nice solid run. And our 10th place finisher, Morgan Shepard, driving for the Wood Brothers. Of course, Matt DiBenedetto drives this car now, and he had a good run uh, just this past week at Kentucky. But uh, Morgan had a nice 10th place finish to add to his a nice season in 1994. So this was a, just a nice set. And, of course, you see in the backs of the cards, it gives the uh, finishing position, the inaugural Brickyard logo, and just gives a little bit of information about each driver's race. Let's see what the copyright says real quick. It does say 1994, so it's going to say 94 high-tech if you look it up in the Beckett or on Trading Card Database. I do believe these cards, though, were released in 95 because obviously this race was run in 1994 in August, so it would have taken them time to have gotten those out. So I hope you guys did enjoy these two small sets, a little look back at the first Brickyard, and a little look back going forward from 1995 at 2005, who they thought maybe the top five of 2005 would be. A couple small sets, always enjoy these small sets, hope you guys did too. Hope you guys have a great rest of your Wednesday morning. Thanks for watching, and have a great day. Oh, by the way, later on today, we're going to open up eight more of the 89 Donners packs. So, anyway, see you later. Have a good one.